Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 1. We left off in verse 14 last time. So get your Bible, open it up to 1 Timothy. While you're doing that, a quick reminder to you that you can study the whole Bible with me, verse by verse, three complete series, almost four, all archived at thebibleversebyverse.com. You choose which series you want to listen to, which book of the Bible, which chapter, click and listen. It's that simple. Bring your Bible. That's all you need at thebibleversebyverse.com. And all you need today is your Bible. I hope you have it and that it is opened to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. We left off in verse 14, so we did study through verse 14, but I want to go back and begin reading in verse 12. Paul writes, I thank Jesus, or I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, and that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. There's hope for you. If you have a hunger for God's word, if you have a desire to repent, maybe you've lived in sin all your life, and maybe you've been deep in sin, some hideous sins that you're too embarrassed to even talk about. You hope nobody will ever find out. God has found out, but it doesn't matter. If you want to repent and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and live for him, and go to heaven after you die instead of going to hell, which is where you're headed right now, you can do it. God will receive you. He received Paul. And Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. God's already saved the worst one, so he can save you if you want it. 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And here he goes, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Some people think that Jesus came to earth to show by example how we should live. And he did do that. He was a great example. He was completely sinless. But he had a far more important reason for coming here, for, as far as we're concerned. His main purpose for giving up omnipresence like he had with the Holy Spirit and the Father and confining himself to a single human body, which he is still confined to at the right hand of the Father. That's what the Bible teaches. His purpose for doing that and coming to earth, this world that he created, and to live among sinners, his primary purpose was to live a sinless life and then to die on the cross and save sinners from hell. We are sinners. We are not good enough to get into heaven. We are not acceptable to God. No one is. We are spiritual beggars without hope. But Jesus died on the cross, paid for our sins, satisfied God's justice on our behalf, Someone needs to save us. We can't do it ourselves. Jesus is the only one who can do that. He paid for our sins. And you take advantage of what he did for you when you repent and receive him as Lord and Savior. 15 again. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The apostle was sure 
that he was by far the worst sinner who had ever lived. He was sure that he was the worst sinner that Jesus will ever save. And it was written in scripture. And the reason Paul was so dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ as a Christian is that he knew how bad he was. He knew how bad he had been. How much he had offended God. And therefore he was so grateful for the Lord's mercy. The more honest we are about our own sinfulness, our own unworthiness, our own depravity, the more we own up to it, the more we acknowledge it, the more we will love Jesus and serve him for his great mercy toward us. Verse 16. Nevertheless, for this cause, I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Paul went from being the worst sinner to one of the most on fire Christians maybe the most on-fire Christian who has ever lived. God had been patient with Paul. And when he turned to Christ, God forgave him and placed in him a love for Jesus to show that he can save anyone and he can change anyone. No one is too bad for God to save if they want to repent, and they do. No one is too bad for God to save. He's already saved the, the worst. The Apostle Paul, 17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So as Paul thinks about his great mercy, the great mercy that God showed him through Christ, he just thinks about it, he's writing about it, and he overflows with praise for God when he thinks about it. it just he can't contain it. You know, you don't have to teach someone who knows they've been saved from hell to worship and thank Christ. It comes natural. I absolutely have no tolerance at all for maybe well-meaning, but still over bearing worship leaders who instruct Christians on how to worship. This is not a show. And I know some of them are well-meaning because I had a, a worship leader say, you were trying to teach people how to worship God. And I said, you don't have to teach people to worship God. Not if they're saved. You don't have to do that. If they're saved, you teach them the word of God. If they're going to church, that's business of the pastors to teach them the word of God. And if they understand what Jesus did for them, praise and worship and singing unto the Lord, if it's good Christian worship music, is going to, is going to be spontaneous. And that's the kind of stuff that God likes. And that's what you see from Paul right here. Verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which pointed to thee, that thou by them 
mightest war a good warfare. As the leader in the Ephesian church, Timothy needs to expose the false teachings and stop the false teachers. And he needs to then teach the truth. There is a spiritual war going on in the world. It is a war for the souls of people. And the mind of man is the battlefield. And the weapons in this warfare are the truth of God's word versus fine sounding deceptions from the world and mostly from the devil. Satan has many different types of deceptions, all designed to take souls to hell. It's not a one size fit all because he knows how every soul is built and what their desires are, what their lusts are. He knows how to entice them. He knows you like a book. He has many helpers. They can take the time to study people, individuals, and know what buttons to push and know how to entice them away from God and Jesus Christ. Satan has many different types of deceptions, many weapons all designed to take souls to hell. And it is the job of a pastor, it is the job of a Bible teacher to expose those deceptions and teach Christians God's word so that they will not be drawn into the error. And a man of God who doesn't teach the pure word of God is a nuisance to God. He is not an asset in this war. He is supposed to be, that's his calling. But if he doesn't teach the pure word of God and expose evil under the guise of tolerance and love and open-mindedness, which is so popular today among so-called Christian groups, just turns my stomach. There are souls at stake. You cowards get out of the pulpit. You world-loving, Satan-serving frauds. Proclaim the word of God. Give up some popularity for the sake of the remnant who needs the truth and will respond to the truth if they hear it, who needs that truth that will protect them from the deceptions of Satan and the world in this spiritual battle that is taking place on planet Earth. If you don't want to be a part of it, then get out of the way and let somebody else step in. Who will do the job? Verse 18 and 19. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which pointed to thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. We're not supposed to get along with the devil's crowd as Christians, as preachers. We're not supposed to make them happy. We're not supposed to be acceptable in their eyes. We're not supposed to be cute and entertaining to them. This is a war. We are supposed to teach and speak the pure truth, knowing that it's going to rub most people the wrong way, and we will be hated by them. Moret, you're a throwback. Thank you very much. I'm a fuddy-duddy. You better believe it. I believe the Bible. I'm stupid enough and old-fashioned enough to believe the Bible and believe what Jesus said. In this world, you will have trouble. All who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I'm stupid enough to believe what, what Jesus said is true. You got a problem with that? Your problem's not with me. Your problem is that you're hell bound. You better repent. Notice 19. Holding faith. He's telling Timothy, you got to hold on to the faith. That means the body of truth that makes up Orthodox, 
biblical Christianity. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Our consciences need to be fed the word of God so that our conscience contains God's truth and God's will. Then, after our consciences are given a steady diet, a daily diet of God's word, and they contain truth, they've been fed, then we have to listen to our conscience and do what it says. Those who ignore their conscience, if they continue, will ruin their faith. They will make shipwreck of their faith. Like Jesus says, even what they have, their faith, the body of truth that they acknowledge will be taken away from them. If you sin against your conscience, the truth that you have believed for who knows how long will be taken away from you. That's what happens when you sin against an informed biblical conscience. You lose even what you had, not just your salvation, but your beliefs. They slowly fall by the wayside, one right after another. In order not to be a casualty of the spiritual war that's taking place on this planet, you have to be faithful to read and study God's word. I'm talking about every day. You say, I'm too busy. You're too busy. You're right. You are exactly right. You are too busy. Get rid of some of that stuff that doesn't matter nearly as much as your immortal soul and the immortal soul of your kids and anybody else who's in your family that you care about. You're too busy. You got that right. In order not to be a casualty. Listen to what I'm saying. You want to be a casualty of this spiritual war and end up burning in the flames of hell? Don't you think that's the most important thing in the world? And in order not to be a casualty of the spiritual war that's going on, a person must be faithful to the truth that they understand. You play with death. Physical death, worse, spiritual death, worst of all, eternal death in the lake of fire. You play with death in all of its aspects when you willfully sin, when you willfully turn against the truth and you don't repent. The road that winds its way through church history is littered with people who have done that. And I'm warning you, no, God is warning you, don't be a spiritual casualty in this war that Paul is telling Timothy to fight and to fight it hard and to fight it well. We need to fight this war with the same intensity that the Allied soldiers fought on the day that they stormed the beaches of Normandy to deliver Europe from Hitler. They went all out. Verse 20. Of whom, and he's going to give an example of a couple of people who are casualties. Of whom are Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. These two guys had ruined their faith. They were spiritual casualties. One of them became a false teacher. 
and the other one just a spiritual troublemaker. Paul kicked them both out of the church. You're not welcome here if that's how you're going to be because I'm not going to let you influence people to follow your evil ways. I'm not going to let you be a bad influence to Christians. And any preacher and any Bible teacher and any pastor who doesn't call out false teachers that are so prominent in the world today and false teaching is not doing what Paul did and what he would do today. The Apostle Paul, if he was alive today, he would be all over radio. He would be all over the Internet as well as speaking publicly, calling out modern evangelicals who water down the word of God, crazy, goofy, charismatic, and Pentecostals who are operating in a system with no boundaries at all. It's just God told me, God showed me, all oh, sorts of nonsense. He'd be blasting away with both barrels and a cannon. He'd be dropping nuclear bombs of truth on them. And he wouldn't have a place to preach. Yeah, he might have a few, but not many. He'd be on his own, just like Jeremiah was in his day. Nobody liked Jeremiah. Establishment sure didn't. Don't you just love the establishment? I don't have a problem with the establishment if the establishment is biblical. I'm, Unfortunately, the establishment, for the most part, is not biblical. I don't care if you're talking about politics or theology. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Let's line things up with the word of God, friends. So Paul, he didn't pull any punches. He told Timothy what to do and how to handle things, and he handled it the same way, the way Jesus would have. He kicked them right out of the church because they were a bad influence, sinning without repenting. He wouldn't stand for it. I did that when I pastored the church. I didn't stand for that kind of stuff. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. You know what? I've never taken an IQ test. I don't want to. I'm afraid we'll show. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm not stupid enough to mishandle the word of God or not do my job as a Bible teacher. I'm not that dumb. I'm smart enough to know that I'm going to stand before Almighty God and give an account, and I better, I better teach the truth. So, these two jokers ruined their faith of their own free will. Apostle kicked them out of church because they would not stop causing trouble. And he also kicked them out to try to wake them up spiritually, too. We would be patient with each other as we grow in Christ. That's one thing. I will spend as much time as I need with an individual Christian who is hungry for the Word of God, sincere about truth, but has a lot of questions. I would do my very best to patiently teach people who want to be taught. And we are to be patient with each other as we grow in Christ. Everybody's at a different level in their walk with the Lord. But when it comes to those who are an evil influence to God's people, there can be no patience. You warn them, if they do not stop, if they do not listen to what the Word of God says, you warn them, if they don't listen, you remove them. You remove them from the church if you're a pastor, you better believe it. And you remove them from your life if you're just a, a if you're a regular Christian. But you remove them. You don't let that garbage influence you or your family or anybody else. You take the bull by the horns and take the lumps along the way for doing it. I just can't get over how many gutless wonders there are, men who call themselves Christians who let lukewarm family members or ungodly family members dictate what goes on in that household rather than taking a stand for Jesus.
Don't understand that. Chapter 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Supplications means you ask God for help. Ask him to meet needs. He wants you to do that. Prayers mean talking to God about whatever's on your mind. Intercession means ask God to help others. And also, we should not forget to say thank you to God, too. Look at one and two. I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I, figuratively speaking, have to hold my nose when I pray for leadership, civil leadership today as I speak right here and now, March 2021. I'll leave it at that. But I pray, I pray for them every single day. Not because I like them, because I don't. Not because I agree with them, because they stand for everything that the Bible is against. The snakes. But I pray for them every day. Because that's what God has commanded us to do. You know, the ruler, you say, yeah, but the ruler that Paul was under back in those days wasn't nearly as bad as the people that are over us today. Don't be too sure about that. The ruler, when Paul wrote this, was Nero. He was a cruel, Christian killing, homosexual crackpot. But we are to pray for all leadership at every level, whether we like them or not, whether they are nice or not. <coughs> Excuse me. We are to pray for them. Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 3. Why pray for them? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. <clears throat> People are in leadership. <coughs> Sorry. Got a tickle in my throat. People are in leadership because God has allowed it for some reason. There are some leaders who are evil and therefore should not be respected as an individual. And you shouldn't agree with what they stand for and speak out against it if it goes against the word of God. However, it is still good in the eyes of God to respect leaders. As much as you may despise them and what they stand for, God still wants us to respect them because of their office. Respect the office of leadership and pray for them. And I stop. We'll pick it up in verse 4 next time. If you want to study the Word of God with me, you can at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. I've been doing this, as I mentioned earlier, for 33 years. Scripture Verse by Verse has been around. Never been underwritten by large church or denomination. Had a chance, but I rejected it. It's been a faith ministry for 33 years, which means I just teach the Word of God 
trust that God will raise up people who love his word. If you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me. Pray for God's word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give. So long.